Hello, this is Talking Europe on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson and my guest today is a newcomer to the European Parliament, but he's far from a newcomer to Europe. From 2014 to 2018, Sandro Godzi was State Secretary for European Affairs in his native Italy, but he has now just taken up one of the 27 MEP seats that were redistributed after Brexit from the UK's allocation. Sandro Godzi was elected last year uh, to the Parliament as part of Emmanuel Macron's centrist Renaissance list of French MEPs. While he was waiting for his seat here to come free, he's also worked as an advisor to the French Prime Minister and as a consultant to the Maltese government. Those jobs the cause for some controversy in late 2019. Sandro Godzi, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you. I'd just like to start uh, um, with the job itself. You've been waiting all these months to actually take up since you yeah. were elected in May last year. Um, the fact that you're an Italian national who stood for a French list in the European Parliament has provoked criticism from some people, notably, for example, the head of the Five Star Movement in Italy, Luigi Di Maio. He called you a, a traitor. Yeah. Um, why should an Italian get to represent a French list? I don't see any reason why he shouldn't. Uh, it's true that the Five Star Movement uh, the neo-fascist uh, Fratelli d'Italia and the Lega Nord of Salvini, they even asked to withdraw my nationality. Uh, they wanted me uh, to renounce the Italian nationality because, for, according to them, I was a traitor. You don't have French nationality. I don't have uh, French nationality. I'm European. I don't need to get the French nationality to be a candidate and to be elected in France. It's something that uh, we, uh, a right that we all have. <coughs> Each European citizen can vote and can be elected at the European Parliament in any member state. It's the first time that a former minister from, is elected in another country. There were, there were two candidates. It mm. was Varoufakis the former finance Greek minister in Germany, it was me in France. I hope that this is the only beginning. I hope that I paved the way to fully exercise our right as European citizens. We are talking about a parliament which represents the citizens of the European Union. Mm -hmm. We are talking about a truly European democracy. You must have transnational politics and you, have transnational, you must have transnational candidates. So uh, would you say that uh, it's not necessarily about living in a country? Because some people might say, look, if you haven't lived in France your whole life, then how can you understand the issues that affect well, French people? For, first of all, I lived in France. I studied in France. I worked in France. I was in France also uh, immediately after the end of my uh, government experience uh, teaching uh, and, uh, and doing other activities. So I, I think that I know France pretty, pretty well, being, uh, being a European. But the point that is that we must get out politics from national boundaries if we want to build up a truly European democracy. What's today the advantage to that? Because the we are quite clear nation states in Europe, different languages, different, different cultural uh, history. Oh, you know, you've got the biggest democracy in the world, which is India, which I think they got, uh, they got more than 20, 20 languages and they can also use all the languages in the Indian parliament. Mm. So, I mean, this is not the point. The point that uh, there is a gap today because we are privilege in the world, we are the only citizen in the world who can elect uh, a representative at continental level. Mm. We are not the only organization. There is uh, NAFTA, there is Mercosur, there are many Asian, there is African Union. But the other citizens in the rest of the world do not elect their members as we do since 1979. But then you don't have a European political space. You've got national politics. We have to build up a truly European political space. We can do that only if we continue in having also candidates in other countries and mm -hmm. talking about truly European issues, not national issues. All right, so you'd like to see more people following your lead uh, next time I around, so. I imagine. Uh, well, let's talk about uh, that controversy that I mentioned right at the top of the show. Yeah. Uh, there was this job as an external consultant to the Maltese government. Um, now, when that came out in the French press, you resigned as an yeah. advisor to the French Prime Minister. Uh, you've said that there was no overlap in these two jobs. Can you tell us when did the job as a consultant to the Maltese government end? The, uh, first of all, uh, last year I was uh, the target of four violent campaigns against me. Four. There by was, uh, there was uh, by nationalists, by enemies, uh, by extreme left, by extreme right, in France by Les Républicains, uh, because uh, I became a target. And I'm a target because uh, with my transnational choice, I represent what the nationalists uh, and the conservatives hate. But there is but a real concern about... if you're working for two governments. No, at the I wasn't same time. working to government. I gave up my uh, consultancy, uh, consultancy job, which was, wasn't only. Or for the Maltese government, was for, for others. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of Malta, I wrote a letter resigning on the 28th of uh, May. 
I wasn't obliged to do so because uh, I was elected but not member of the European, Par mm -hmm. European Parliament. But I thought that it was, uh, it was uh, uh, a matter of opportunity mm -hmm. to stop my uh, consultancy activities with the different uh, partner and client which I had. And then, uh, uh, at the time, I couldn't imagine that Edouard Philippe would have asked me uh, to join uh, his cabinet as uh, advisor. He did so at the end of July. I started uh, in France uh, uh, 1st of August, and there, isn't, uh, there, hasn't been, there hasn't been any judicial or conflict of interest uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, problem because there wasn't a conflict of interest, but it so was why part of the campaign. <laughs> I resigned because an advisor either helps or he goes, he quits. And as my presence in Matignon had become a matter for controversy, I thought that it was the best way is, was to leave, and the controversy uh, is gone, as, as I assure. But it has been very violent, it has been very unfair, mm -hmm. it has been very hard, but, you know, politics is sometimes unfair and hard. Well, just speaking about Malta, since you gave up that job, Malta's uh, Prime Minister of the time, Joseph Muscat, he's actually been pushed by a very large, um, continuous protest and outcry to resign. Uh, it was linked to re re revelations, excuse me, linking people close to him to the murder of Daphne Caruana Galizia, the journalist. Um, do you regret having taken up a job uh, for him? No, I don't regret uh, to, to having taken a job for someone uh, who, with whom Italy has worked very well. When I was in government in Italy, we have worked very well with the Mortis presidency. We have very, worked very well to organize the anniversary of the 60th year of the Treaty of Rome. Uh, after that, I, sto I, I, I stopped my activities. Joseph Muscat was still a candidate for the top job. I remind you that in June, uh, in the council, in the European country, we were talking about Joseph Muscat taking a post at the top job. I deeply regret what has happened, and I hope that uh, a full uh, clarity uh, will be made through the inquiry. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I never got any professional relations with the people involved there. I was an external consultant, and I hope that everything will be clarified. Of course, what has happened is, is uh, absolutely terrible. Well, the corruption watchdog Transparency International, uh, e even since the resignation of Joseph Muscat, has still been very critical about Malta, said that the country's mired in corruption. It dragged its feet on the investigation into Daphne Caruana and Galizia's death. Um, and it says that Europe shouldn't be complacent at this point. So Malta does have a new prime minister, Robert Abella. Do you believe things have changed in Malta? I do believe that things have to change in Malta uh, uh, and should change in Malta since, uh, since uh, 25 uh, years. I mean, if uh, uh, there are some constitutional problems, uh, which are both, uh, I mean, uh, a responsibility of the right and the left. Uh, so, I mean, if there, if, uh, and if we uh, verify that there is a rule, of po a rule of law problem in Malta, I am the first to say that this must be tackled. After all, it was my initiative under the Italian presence in the Council mm. to start to have a dialogue on rule of law finally in the General Affairs Council, in the Council of the EU. And what I said for the country, it fully applies uh, in Malta. And I think that there, are, there is, a, there is a, which an inquiry of the European Parliament, of the Council of Europe, which uh, mm -hmm. is going on and must go, must go on, because it is clear that we have to be, make sure that all the member states of the European Union uh, fully comply with the rule of law and fundamental rights. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's not the case. It seems it's not to, be, not to be the case in Malta. It mm. seems not to be the case in Poland and Hungary. Mm. The, yes, we have a problem you, and we have, to, we have to tackle that. Are you among the, the voices here at the European Parliament who support the idea of withholding some European funding yes. to states that have rule it of law Yes, it was problems? my proposal as... Uh, uh, Europe uh, Minister for Italy in 2016. Because there are people who say that that actually punishes the citizens rather than the government. No, it, does, it, pu it punishes the government because it is clear that uh, uh, the government must uh, be held accountable. And the only way of being held accountable, we have, we have seen in the experience, take the experience of uh, the attitude uh, of, the, of uh, Orban or the, of Kaczynski towards migrants when uh, we were in that under pressure in Italy. The only the only way of making them understand they, uh, that they must comply with the rule. And the solidarity is not a one-way street. It doesn't count only when you get the money. It counts only when you have to get some uh, political refugees. The only way is to put a conditionality. If you, don't, uh, if you don't comply with the rule of law, if you don't comply with migratory obligation, we don't give you, we don't give you our money.
All right, we mentioned migration there. Um, you're an ex-minister in the Italian government, so just looking back at the situation in Italy, uh, just a few days ago, Matteo Salvini, the former uh, interior minister and, and deputy prime minister, had his immunity lifted so that he could be put on trial in a case of not allowing some migrants off of a, a rescue ship uh, in Italy last year. Uh, let's take a look at this report to, just to bring us up to date on some of the facts of the case. Defiant and unfazed, Despite a potentially career-ending trial on the horizon for Matteo Salvini, the far-right leader appeared calm and assured on Thursday, pleading innocence, claiming his actions were in the best interests of the country's security. I do not have any kind of fear or concern, because I remind myself and others that Article 52 of the Italian Constitution, on which I swore as minister, states that the defence of a homeland is a duty of every citizen, even more so if you are a minister. I therefore think I have just protected the security, the borders and the dignity of my country. Salvini's words came in response to a Senate vote to remove his legal protection over accusations that he illegally detained over 100 migrants at sea on board the Gregoretti. Prosecutors accused the former Italian interior minister of crossing a line when he forced a majority of them to stay in rancid conditions aboard the ship, with one toilet chair between them. The migrants eventually came on shore after the EU helped broker a deal. Salvini says his hardline stance had the support of the Prime Minister and the rest of the Italian government. The days that I blocked the ship before the disembarkment was a shared decision, agreed with Conte, Di Maio, Bonafede and Toninelli. But if needed, we will talk about it in a courtroom and not today, but it's clear and evident it was a shared choice. But prosecutors allege he acted alone. Salvini could eventually face up to 15 years in jail if found guilty at the end of Italy's tortuous legal process. The conviction could also bar him from political office, dashing his ambitions to lead a future government. A report by Jean-Emile Germain. Uh, Sandro Godzi, uh, so having watched that report, this is actually quite a rare event, isn't it, to have a, a politician's immunity lifted in this way. And Matteo Salvini says that he wants to go to court. He wants to put his side across. Now, for his detractors and those who oppose his views on migrants, is this potentially a bit of a counterproductive move? No, but it's, it's, a, it's a matter of, uh, of law, of, of respect, uh, our respect of uh, Italian laws, first of all. So I think that the magistrates uh, have done their job and they cannot ask themselves uh, whether it's politically opportune or not to do something. If you need to open inquiry, you open inquiry. Politically, uh, Matteo Salvini bears a huge responsibility because politically and from the human point of view, you cannot, uh, you cannot held in hostage uh, for one week uh, 100 human beings in, on, on a boat. So politically, I think that our judgment must be very severe against Salvini. From the judiciary point of view, it is up to, to the magistrate to verify whether there are responsibility. And if Salvini uh, says, as he said, that also Conte, Di Maio, Toninelli, the other member of the government and the current mm -hmm. prime minister, uh, all the responsibility, I think that in court he will uh, have the possibility to show that there are responsibilities also of, of other members of that government, which has been a no-fall government for Italy and a no-fall government for Europe. We're just uh, looking at another very pressing uh, issue for Europe, a uh, word about Brexit. Uh, the UK has left the EU formally, but this transition is still going on. Uh, just in the last few days, the UK government has talked about its new immigration rules that it wants to have yeah. once it's fully a third member of the EU and outside the transition period. It wants to make it a lot harder, essentially, uh, for less skilled workers to enter the UK from the European Union. Uh, what do you make of this announcement? Do you see European countries like France, like Italy, imposing the similar strict conditions on British workers who want to come to Europe? I mean, it is clear that it is a matter of uh, British... It's a, it's a matter for British decision. It is up to the Brits. It's about up to turn down the street. But if the UK does whether, impose those whether, kind of conditions, would the EU... It is clear that, I mean, on such sensitive issues, such as the circulation of EU citizens, we will apply reciprocity. And uh, so there will be a, 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 a reciprocal approach uh, between what London uh, does and decides towards the citizens of our 27 member state and what we as 27 member state will decide towards the British citizens. I hope that uh, there will be a constructive attitude 
but it's going to be a very difficult negotiation on this and also on other points. Well, speaking about other points in terms of trade, uh, the UK government publicly, repeatedly refusing to accept the idea of sticking with EU standards as they evolve in the future. Um, it's known as dynamic alignment. Do you, yeah. do you take this position seriously or do you see it as a negotiating bluff? I always take uh, the position of our negotiating, negotiating partners seriously. We are very clear. The more they align to EU uh, rules, uh, the more the EU market will be open. The less they align, the less the EU market will be open. Mm. And from this point of view, there is full respect, uh, but there isn't uh, equality in the, in the weight, because we are the first market in the world, and the UK is a big country, but it's not the first market in the world. Mm. Uh, we, uh, our flows with UK represent 9% of the total, uh, total uh, overall amount of EU flows, uh, uh, the 47% are the uh, uh, export mm. of UK towards the EU. So from this perspective, the relation is not balanced. We want to have a balanced relationship. We want to have a satisfactory uh, solution. Mm. But it is clear uh, that uh, if uh, the UK diverge a lot from EU standard, the market uh, won't be as open as it could be. Well, just time for one very quick last question. Fears of a no-deal scenario are back with us. Uh, how likely would you say it is that there will be a proper trade deal between the UK and the EU at the end of this transition period? It's impossible to say. It's very desirable. Uh, I hope, I think that uh, the negotiation uh, will be very intensive. It is difficult to say, it is impossible to say that we will have a comprehensive agreement by the end of this year. Let's try to make the best, at least, of the trade part of this negotiation. But oh, everything is open and everything could be possible. All right, Sandra, good to see you. Thank you very much for Thank being you. our guest here on Talking Europe. Thanks to you for watching as well. Do stay with us in part two of the programme. We're going to be discussing a recently ratified, another trade deal, in fact, between the EU and Vietnam. See, ya, see you then in part two of Talking Europe. France 24, every art form. Liberté, égalité, actualité. Residents from France's disadvantaged suburbs tell their own stories and take the viewers beyond the usual cliches about the French banlieue. Sur le plan euh, humain, c'est en fait c'est une expérience de fou en fait. Les habitants valent beaucoup mieux que ce qu'on en dit. Tu rends fier ta ville, les, les, les gens qui, quand ils me voient dans la rue, me disent « je suis fier de toi, je t'ai vu passer à la télé, c'est bien comment t'as parlé, tu nous as bien représenté. » Watch the daily reality in the Bonlier Project on France 24 and France24.com.